Donald Trump's last remaining surrogate, Kellyanne Conway, is making the talk show rounds touting that one of Trump's successes is that he didn't start a new war. But the U.S. has been at war for almost all of its 245 years. War is so ingrained in our collective psyche that we barely even notice we're in it. With me today, Michael D. Knox, author of Ending U.S. Wars by Honoring Americans Who Work for Peace. Michael, welcome to the program. Thank you, Juliana. It's great to be here. Oh, by the way, stay tuned to this interview because Michael and I disagreed and I kind of busted his balls a little bit. See what you think about the difference between calling something a peace movement, and calling something an anti-war movement. I'd love to hear your comments about it. And now back to our show. I'm, I'm so glad you could join us today. I'd like to start with a quote from your book, Ending U.S. Wars. Imagine a, challenge, a change in our culture so momentous that Americans who stand for peace are celebrated rather than denounced as unpatriotic, anti-military, or un-American. Uh, imagine a world in which expressing an anti-war position is an aspiration our children are encouraged to respect, admire, and emulate rather than be sneered at for. Your book is outlining a behavioral approach to prompt this seismic cultural shift. Can you talk about what motivated you to write it and why is now the time, uh, you know, for readers to engage with it? Well, the U.S. has bombed no less than 30 countries in my lifetime since the end of World War II. We've killed millions of people. We've maimed uh, tens of millions. We've destroyed economies and infrastructure. And uh, this kind of murderous behavior is continuing uh, under Democrats and Republicans since, since the end of World War II. No other country in this world has killed as many people or made as many refugees. So we have a serious problem with war. We have a war culture in the United States and it continues, as I said, no matter who is in the Oval Office or who is in Congress. So we need to make American people more aware of our war culture and how we might move towards a culture of peace. And when I was visiting Washington DC in 2005 with my son as a graduation gift from college to him, I uh, began to realize that Washington is full of war monuments and monuments to wartime presidents and uh, even if the uh, particular person depicted uh, wasn't involved in wars, they might be holding a pistol or a rifle or the monument is surrounded with cannons. And there were very few uh, peaceful places in Washington, D.C. That, that I could find. So it occurred to me that there should be a national monument called the U.S. Peace Memorial in Washington, D.C. so that people become aware of what our peacemakers have done uh, over the years and what current peacemakers are doing at great risk to themselves. There are consequences in this country to speaking out against war and you have to have some courage. So our attempt Michael. to elevate people to role models. I, Michael, I have, um, I have often wondered why right next to, in our airports, the special lounge for the military, there isn't a special lounge for the activists who are literally sometimes right there in the airport with signs, et cetera. I mean, that would be well, that's, nice. That's a good point. I mean, we honor our military. It's clear. I mean, even uh, President-elect Biden's uh, speech, uh, you know, his uh, acceptance speech of the nomination ended with, may God bless our troops and his speech accepting the victory as the president. Uh, you know, again, he ended it with uh, you know, asking God to bless the troops. And every president has done that. President Obama uh, always did that. He pointed out the military in the audience and said, you're the best this country has to offer. Thank you for your service. But not thanking healthcare workers, you know, that's not the thing. That's not thanking educators 
or people who work for peace or scientists or people who uh, work in the grocery stores or are especially uh, now with the with the yeah. coronavirus and people basically risking their lives for other Americans by working at the grocery store. Exactly. I don't and, know we could we could still thank the military if they were out <clears throat> on, you know, peace peacekeeping, peace giving missions, food, exactly. delivery, et cetera. Exactly. But yeah. when you think of all the countries we're, we're invading, and right now they're the countries that we are dropping bombs on uh, right now today are countries like Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, Somalia, Libya, uh, Yemen, Najjar. Uh, these countries are poor countries. They're underdeveloped. The people are impoverished. They have no means to defend themselves, much less attack the United States, and yet we continue to drop bombs on them, destroy their families and, and their infrastructure. I mean, and most, most people who come at this issue don't come at it in the same way that you are, and I find it very interesting what you're doing. They come at it, um, you know, the military industrial complex is making money dropping bombs on poor people because then they get to make more bombs and sell them back to the U.S. And, uh, you know, they try to come at it that way. But you're tr making the case that what we need to do is a cultural shift in the United States. Um, and I really like that. Uh, can we talk about the U First, let's talk about those systems that we have here that play into the culture. You mentioned just the iconography of Washington, D.C. How does the U.S. public education system play into the culture of war that you describe in your book? Well, the education system is part of it in many ways. In colleges, I'm a university professor. We have, of course, the, uh, off the ROTC all over the place. We have defense to contra contracts in the university, uh, textbooks that middle school and high school students read are just U.S. wars. It's war to war, industrial revolution, back to war and war and civil rights and war and the space race and back to war. And there's no mention of people who've worked for peace. And they're just not elevated in this society. Our culture gives all kinds of discounts, uh, you know, park passes, national park passes for free to the military. There are all kinds of awards and discounts at uh, Home Depot and uh, various stores. There are always days to celebrate and honor people who serve in the military, but we need to honor other people in our society as well. Healthcare workers are, are just one, but educators are important, scientists are important, salespeople are important, everyone who makes our communities work. But instead, we're always focused on the military. It's hard to attend any event, whether it's a church event or an athletic event or, or a public you know, a city, city council meeting without there being some mention of the veterans and the soldiers and all other groups are ignored. And this just tells me that the primary focus of our country is militarism. And that's, that's what we do. That's how we make our money. And our representatives in and, and Congress are all bribed on a regular basis through ca campaign contributions by the people who benefit from war. Um, what would it look like to disrupt the cycle of war glorification and, and build a civic culture we seek, um, seeking peace. I would imagine that in the education system, it would be, as you said, adding some peace movement information exactly. to history books. Good luck with exactly. that. They're all printed in well, text. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think my, you know, my book, Ending U.S. Wars by Honoring Americans Who Work for Peace, is the U.S. Peace Memorial. We document over 200 individuals and organizations and exactly what they've done in behaviorally specific terms, what they've done to oppose war. There, there are over 900 activities that people have engaged in, and many of these are things that any American can do. So if you oppose war, if you think that we should be spending the money that we spend on war on things like uh, education and healthcare for everyone and working on the environment and uh, maintaining our infrastructure rather than killing, then you can do simple things like writing letters to your members of Congress. They have the House of Representatives, the people there run every two years, so they are susceptible to public opinion. Uh, writing letters to the editor. So we cover these, as I said, 900 specific behaviors people have engaged in all the way 
from things like writing a letter to the editor up through civil disobedience, things that get people uh, in jail. So, you know, there's a wide range of think things you can engage in to oppose war. And we're trying to elevate role models who have engaged in these things. We that also would be give a, an a annual great idea of elevating yeah. role models who've engaged at these things, because as your work discusses, there's the psychological aspect. Um, could you could you talk about how the U.S. employs scare tactics and ideas of what American heroism looks like in order to keep the populace committed to upholding the culture of war? Well, as I say, there are consequences to speaking out against war. You might, family members might not speak with you. You might lose a job or, you know, or a promotional opportunity, things the like that. The only person who spoke out about peace during the last election cycle was Marianne Williamson, who got, you know, who got uh, painted mm -hmm. as a woo-woo kook when she's yeah. not really. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she did, and uh, you know, Tulsi Gabbard had her own own way of approaching that, and, True. Uh, I forgot and Bernie that. Sanders did as well. But but none of them said the word peace, except no. for Marianne. <clears throat> no, but I want people to say the war the word anti war and not the word peace because peace is misunderstood in our culture. Well, that's where yeah. I'm at. I feel like we got to go beyond anti-war. Anti-war means war and then against the thing that you don't want, where peace is something we can build toward. And if there's an un misunderstanding, shouldn't we undo the misunderstanding? Well, don't be so anti about anti. Anti-war <laughs> should not be should not be hyphenated. It's no it's no different than antibiotic or antifreeze or anti-diarrheal. These are good things, you know. We we want people to be against war. But you can be for peace, on right? Isn't being for peace a get, being against war? No, I'm afraid not. I in my research, I find lots of peace memorials all around the country that really are monuments to war. We have uh, the Strategic Air Command's uh, motto is "Peace is our profession." We have. Uh, the well, because they're blocking the word peace. Why can't we take it back? We've got to we've got to take back the word peace. I'm not sure we can. Even our, our churches are involved in uh, in supporting war. It's not the military industrial complex anymore. It's you know, religion, education, entertainment, sports. Everyone is involved in maintaining this culture of war. Yes. And, when you when you think about the soldiers, I would say the majority of American soldiers that are involved in supporting or actually killing people are people who grew up in churches where they honored uh, a god they called the Prince of Peace, and they respected the Ten Commandments and Thou shalt not kill, and maybe the Golden Rule that you shouldn't do things unto others that you wouldn't want done unto yourself. And yet, uh, they, we go on and we kill millions of people more people since World War II than any other country has killed. Michael and invaded more countries than any other country. So peace is misunderstood. Well, you have, um, you just named three different areas. Uh, we talked a little bit about education, but I really would like to bring up to people's consciousness, maybe some, un and you just mentioned churches, some, sort of ways that they are unconsciously being programmed to be pro-war um, or war mongers, <laughs> even if they don't know it. Uh, talk about where we see this in well, the culture. I know we're, you mentioned well, sports. Me, yeah, I mentioned sports because during the Obama administration, Obama you know, essentially paid NFL teams to have patriotic halftime shows honoring the soldiers. And they would they would trot out some military or some veterans. Everyone stand for them, and they actually pay the New England Patriots and the other teams millions of dollars to do that. So that got carried over naturally to college teams and high school teams. And every time they have a halftime show or several times during the season, they will focus on the military. And that's just one way that it's insidious. The government pays and reinforces it. And uh, one of my favorite comedians, uh, George Carlin, talked about how some sports, including football, I can't, he, he said, you know, uh, 
that baseball used to be the natural nat, national pastime where people just stood in the field and you'd you know catch and run and um and then it became football which was far more warlike in its playing and i i just mm -hmm. thought that was very genius because there is uh you know an underlying psychological aspect of being involved in something like watching football yeah, yeah, I, I guess that's true. It is. It's not necessarily sport. just the flyovers, which is also a problem, but the actual <laughs> football that makes you love fighting, war, tech, tech, tactical. Mm -hmm. You know. Well, well, you mentioned flyovers. Interesting. We should be honoring the healthcare workers who are putting themselves at great risk. So, uh, the government, uh, in its effort to honor. Uh, Healthcare workers had flyovers of fighter jets all around the country. These fighter jets were, you know, reminding us of the connection. I guess they were trying to create a connection between war and killing and healthcare workers by having these kinds of flyovers. So oh <laughs> that's fighter jets, yes, to honor healthcare workers. Can you imagine? How about no. sending them some masks? How about dropping <laughs> masks out of the sky? Well, How about that? Exactly. And not just them. I mean, you and I should be able to buy N95 masks, the masks that really work. We should be able to get them. Healthcare workers can't even get them. In, and are they're no longer disposable. They have to be used over and over again. They're transmitting. Well, those flyover airplanes, Michael, they, are, they cost a pretty penny. We don't have uh, enough ex money. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, they do. Thinking? And we need to do something. There are great there are connections between so many of the things that are happening right now. The the insurrection on January sixth, uh, the uh, you know police brutality, uh, the way we're celebrating healthcare workers, and we don't have enough money for vaccines. Uh, I can't get a vaccine. There, you know, people that need them can't get them. We can't get masks. There are connections between this and the military and the fact that we have a culture of war. Mm -hmm. And our young people are taught, and I think you saw it on January 6th, our young people are taught uh, by our country, by our leaders, that if you don't like what some other person, or in this case country is doing, you don't like their behavior, you don't like the religion, you don't like what they stand for, or if they have something you want, what do you do? You fight them, you bomb them, you disrupt them, you change their leadership. And that is not the message we want to give to the American people. That's what they tried on January 6th because they didn't like the decision that had been made. We see the police departments hiring military veterans who are trained to kill. They're not trained in social worker psychology. They're not, they're not trained to negotiate. Most of their training is about using weapons and marksmanship and under the Obama administration, special incentives were set up to be sure that the local police departments hired military veterans rather than people that might be better able and better suited for uh, local police departments. That led, I think, to more brutality and the fact that the military gave weapons, the Defense Department gave weapons, military grade weapons to local police departments uh, led to police brutality in, in, in greater form. So they we should have given them some flowers. <laughs> I mean, really, can we can we get a little softer here? We're speaking with Michael D. Knox, psychologist and dist distinguished professor emeritus founder of the U.S. Peace Memorial Foundation and now the author of the new book, Ending U.S. Wars by Honoring Americans Who Work for peace. Dr. Knox's long-standing peace and anti-war activities began in 1965 in opposition to the war against Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. I like how you put that in there. You don't forget those other countries that we also <laughs> murdered and killed in. <laughs> in, yeah. in 2005, uh, Michael Knox founded the U.S. Peace Memorial Foundation, which he currently chairs. Michael, final question. Uh, and I do thank you so much for coming on the program here today. Can you talk about the U.S. P Peace Memorial Foundation? How does the work you do there dovetail with the conclusions that you draw in the book, Ending U.S. Wars? Well, thank you. It's a 501c3 not-for-profit organization. Uh, the U.S. Peace Memorial Foundation has three aspects to it. One is the U.S. Peace Registry, which you can read in the book or online at uspeacememorial.org. The U.S. Peace 
registry documents, what hundreds of Americans have done to oppose war. From that set of individuals and organizations, every year we choose someone to receive the U.S. Peace Prize. We've given the U.S. Peace Prize to people um, such as Cindy Sheehan, Dennis Kucinich, Noam Chomsky, uh, um, Medea Benjamin, Christine Ahn, Ajamu Baraka, David Swanson, Anne Wright, Veterans for Peace, uh, Kathy Kelly, Code Pink, Women for Peace, a variety of organizations, Chelsea Manning, uh, organizations and individuals over the last 12 years. And the third project is we're raising funds to build a national U.S. Peace Memorial National Monument in Washington, D.C., where we will document what these Americans have done. And we will surround it with uh, quotations from famous Americans, quotations that will help to change our culture because people will see that great Americans, Americans they've heard of and respected, like Margaret Mead and Helen Keller and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Muhammad Ali, various presidents, um, People have opposed war in very strong terms, such as Albert Einstein saying that war is nothing but an act of murder. Uh, so we think that having a monument, having living role models for peace, uh, reinforcing their behavior, documenting exactly what they've done in a behaviorally specific way is a good way for Americans to know that they can change the culture and our culture can change it. There have been significant changes in my lifetime regarding gender and race and LGBTQ and- We knocked down a bunch marijuana. of those statues. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Things Lots are changing. of changes and it's quite possible that we can move towards a culture of peace. And I hope that your, your audience will read Ending U.S. Wars by Honoring Americans Who Work for Peace. Michael D. Knox, author of Ending U.S. Wars by Honoring Americans Who Work for Peace. You can follow the Peace Memorial on Twitter at U.S. Peace Memorial. Thank you so much for being here with us, and thanks for the work that you do. Thank you, Juliana. Thank you very much. You're watching ACT TV. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. We have all kinds of great stuff on it. Thanks for watching. You can follow me, Juliana Forlano, on Twitter and follow ACT TV across platforms where we're still allowed to be.